Thank you very much, and good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank uh, members of Polity for giving me this opportunity to um, share my thoughts with you this evening. And I'm especially pleased to be speaking um, to an, a Tembusu audience because I have um, very deep ties with Tembusu. Um, your first, your, your master, your current master, first inaugural master of Tembusu, is a dear friend of mine from the history department. And I remember speaking to him way back in maybe 2010 to persuade him to um, apply for the position of master of Tembusu College. And I'm very glad he did because he's done wonderful work building up the college from scratch. Um, I've also known um, many of your uh, f staff and faculty um, because I was involved in hiring them. Sarah, Connor, a few others, some of you are here tonight. And um, my own children, S Cheryl, my elder daughter, spent four years in Tembusu, and my son, Ben, is now a Tembusian. So I've got very deep ties with Tembusu. I'm delighted to be speaking um, with all of you this evening. Now, uh, the theme for tonight's talk is uh, 15 minutes uh, and they said uh, po possibilities, right, on possibilities. And I'm, I was asked if I could share with you um, some of my personal journeys in, in, in connection with the idea of uh, possibilities. But instead of sharing with you my story, I, uh, a personal story or, or an autobiographical story, I thought I'd share with you uh, the possibilities uh, that came with a piece of land, with a piece of land. And I'm going to talk about how U-Town was conceived. 2007, that was the year when the Singapore government decided to give this plot of land on which we are now sitting or standing, which used to be a nine-hole golf course, to the National University of Singapore, to NUS. Um, we were, of course, hoping to expand. NUS uh, has really expanded in terms of population, but the current um, campus was actually built originally in the 1980s to house 10,000 students only. That was the plan. But by the time we got to uh, 20, the, the, the noughties, as you call it, um, the population of NUS has grown to 30,000. So you can imagine the squeeze uh, that was felt on the main campus itself. So when the government agreed to give us this plot of land, which was 11 hectares of land, former golf course, we were very delighted. But there was a, there was a catch. Um, this was in 2007, one year before the Youth Olympics, and Singapore was chosen as the inaugural site for the Youth Olympics in 2008, some of you might recall. So the condition was that you use this piece of land and you build the Games Village for the 2008 Youth Olympics. We were given one year to do it. So, of course, you never look a gift horse in the mouth, and when this was offered to us, even with that kind of condition, NUS decided to take it up. But as things would have it, you know, the prices of commodities went up and various other things complicated the process. NUS decided that it could not deliver on that condition. So we said we will not be able to build a games village in time. So the games village, thankfully for us, was moved to NTU. They had a big headache over there, but it was their headache, not ours. Um, but the government, to their credit, decided since the land has been offered to NUS, now this was a wonderful opportunity because what it meant was that we now had a piece of land, 11 hectares, and we weren't rushed into building something for somebody else. We were now given the possibility of imagining how we would like to use the space. So this was when uh, President Tan Cho Chuan, then President of NUS, had this vision he wanted something that would transform student life in NUS. Remember, I spoke about the cramped um, conditions in the main campus. And if you look at the main campus in NUS, you, you'll notice that it is a series of buildings, one building after another. Space was planned uh, in a rather ad hoc manner. I mean, the master plan was conceived of maybe in the 1970s, and then things were added on as the years went by. So there was no central concept of what the campus would look like. So this was an opportunity um, to do something that would be iconic on the one hand and transformative on the other. Let me talk about the transformative first. Uh, Professor Tan Cho Chuan was very student-centric. He wanted to make sure that students, when they go through three, four years in NUS, they would have something that would impact their lives. So he decided that if we had a place like this, we could build 
colleges, residential colleges, that would be small communities in which students would have um, the opportunities of living and learning and having very holistic experiential experience. And he decided not to create more halls of residence or dormitories like the PGP, but very distinctive residential colleges along the lines of the Oxbridge, Harvard, Princeton, Yale model. But this would of course have to be adapted to the Singapore context. And also this had, had to be sort of uh, embedded in the kinds of structures that we have, the faculties and the schools. So here, the idea was to build residential colleges that would draw students from all over NUS, mix them up, have them live in a college where they not just come here for food and bed, but they also have a chance to learn. So the kinds of courses that you now take at the colleges, the five modules, IEM or what have you, this was conceived in that spirit that you will not just come here to stay, but you will learn in the college as well. But it was not sufficient just to build colleges and have them stand alone. You wanted the spaces to support the kind of learning experiences that you want the students to have as fully as possible. So here was where the whole concept of an integrated university town was conceived. We wanted spaces for students to stay, live, we wanted spaces for students to study. We wanted spaces for students to hang out. We wanted spaces for students to do their sports. We wanted spaces for students to do their cultural activities, dances, singing, music. So the whole place was conceived as an integrated whole. And that was the opportunity that was offered to us, the possibility that was offered to us because we had a, a piece of land on which to build um, this whole concept of university town. So, this, we hope, would transform the way students study and experience NUS. Now, NUS has grown too big, as I said, 35,000 students, not 25,000 undergraduates and 10,000 graduates. It's very hard to build community when you're talking about a scale of that size. So what we wanted to do was to create these residential colleges as smaller sub-communities within the larger community. So we wanted to develop what we call stickiness. In other words, if you were to spend time in a college, you live together, you eat together, you study together, you spend time together, you are likely to build bonds, identity. And to us, this was important because I studied at NUS in the early 80s. I was a commuter student, meant I took a bus to school. At the end of the day, I took a bus back. I never really developed any sort of attachment to the school. And my peers of that generation felt the same way. We wanted to change that. So by allowing students to spend this sort of time together, we hope that they develop some sort of identity together. It's okay if this was a Tembusu identity, but then the Tembusu identity would then be linked to a U-Town identity and then to an NUS identity. That was the plan. So the whole idea was to build small communities and then link these small communities to the larger NUS community. So, a transformative experience, number one. The second was iconic. Now, if you took away U-Town, if you took away U-Town, and I challenge you to look at Cambridge campus and find something that is iconic. In other words, something you would put on a postcard to say that this is NUS, what would you choose? Central Library? <laughs> Old Admin Block or AS8 now? <laughs> Nothing, right? It's very, it was very challenging. And for years, when we were looking for something that was iconic to represent NUS, we were challenged. You know, a lot of universities, you go to Berkeley, Harvard, you have the clock towers, you have the squares, you have the quads or what have you. But what did NUS have? Actually, it was quite depressing. It was just a series of buildings. So now, you had University Town, which is actually quite an iconic space. Now, look at Town Green. Look at Town Green. There is no space like this in all of NUS. NUS has no green space that is designed for social purposes. Yes, you, you, you can mention the football fields, but they're different. This is a space that was designed not just to give the kind of depth. When you walk into U-Town, you see the green in front of you. It creates a certain sense of um, beauty and a nice environment, um, as opposed to just seeing a series of buildings. So we were determined to have a green space like this. Of course, 
other people challenge us. They say, oh, but this is a waste of space. Why don't you build two labs here, one more lab here, one more department here? We resisted that. We said that green space is important and we wanted to put that green space to use. And if you look at what's happening now at Town Green on a daily basis, people playing frisbee, football, activities, having picnics on a weekend, we have done shows, we have done rock concerts. This was iconic and this was what we meant by creating something different. Now, we also wanted to make sure that U-Town would just not be an enclave. You know, the danger of putting residential colleges on one side and the rest of NUS on the other side is that you're going to have a ghetto here of people who live in NUS or live in U-Town and not wanting anything to do with Old Town, as they were called at one stage. <laughs> and then the people from Old Town were angry that the people in U-Town were having all these special uh, facilities and special privileges. So nothing was left to chance, I can tell you that. Nothing was left to chance. When I was planning uh, how U-Town would be, uh, the spaces here would be used, I, make, I made sure, working with every faculty, that the timetabling of classes, the timetabling of classes in all faculty would bring about 10,000 students onto this side of the bridge every week. So classes were actually planned to make sure that there would be a mix of students. I remember when U-Town was opened in 2011, President Tan Cho Chuan, after having spent hundreds of millions of dollars building all the beautiful facilities, he said to me, he said, I'm handing U-Town over to you now because I was in charge of the overall planning. Make sure it doesn't become a white elephant. He said, make sure it doesn't become a white elephant. In other words, beautiful, pristine buildings, then nobody using it. I, and I assured him, I said, don't worry, U-Town will be a success. Well, I think U-Town has been a success in terms of how crowded it has become. But maybe we are now a, a victim of our own success, right? In that, you know, it is very crowded. And I remember in the first two or three years, maybe still even now, we were having difficulties managing the bus systems because the buses were crumbling under the weight of so many people coming back and forth. What I did not occur to me when I was planning the movement of people was we were planning for students. But then, as we did the analysis, we found that not only students, but staff and faculty were coming to U-Town for lunch. So there was, that added a few more hundred people, or maybe a thousand more people, during the peak hours of, say, 11.30 to 2 o'clock. So these were some of the issues uh, that uh, we had to face with. But I think on the whole, I'm very pleased to see that um, that piece of land that was offered to us in 2007 has been put to such good use, and the kinds of vision that Professor Tan Cho Chuan had, that we all tried to realize together as a team, has to a large extent been realized because the Musu is a success story. The kinds of activities that you do um, confirms or validates our desire to make sure that students have a very holistic learning experience. And I remember even a simple thing like a meal plan, a meal plan, we discussed long and hard because we didn't want students to consider eating in the hall as a kind of a function. That's it. You ate because you were hungry, lunch was served, you ate and you went. The design of the hall, the cost of the food, all these were taken into consideration to create an environment where we felt that eating was also a social and learning activity. In other words, you mingled. You discussed things. I hope you discussed things during, at the dining hall. And then you have a chance to meet people from different faculties. And we m deliberately mixed up the composition of each college. So you don't have a college for the jocks, you know, as they call it, the, the basketball college, the college for the computer geeks, or the college for the arts people. We deliberately mix it up. And I remember Greg and I worked very closely to develop systems even, systems of selection, so that we chose our students very carefully. And I'm told that uh, Tumbusu and the other colleges as well now are in demand and that you know, they have to turn away more students than they admit. How much time do I have left? I don't know. I've lost track of time. Uh, no, okay, I'm not, I've not seen it. I've got, oh, this is 14 minutes. So I'm going to quickly end two minutes by just sharing with you uh, a, a few factoids about uh, U-Town which you all may not know about. First, you realize that you all know, right, there's only one bus stop in U-Town. Eh? Why was that the case? Although, if you look around U-Town, there were a few places that we have built 
just outside the Musu, there's a bus stop, right? But it's never used. Well, when we first started, there were lots of pressures for us to have buses running around university town. But I was determined for three reasons why that would not happen. Number one, I wanted the town to be as green as possible. In other words, we didn't want buses with fumes and all this running around the town. Second, I wanted a healthy lifestyle. So I wanted people to walk more, <laughs> cycle more, cycle more, walk more. And I thought that was important because walking was not just a physical activity. It was also a social activity because when you walk, you meet people, you say hello, you have a conversation. If you are standing in a bus being delivered from, say, Faculty of Arts to Tembusu, you are squeezed in the middle, and when the time comes for you to get off, you get off, and that's it. So we wanted to achieve that. But lastly, there was a cost issue as well, because um, we calculated if we added the buses, the drivers, the scheduling, it would have cost us $1 million more a year just to have buses running around U-Town. And basically, we felt that that $1 million could be put to better use. So there's one factoid for you. Second, do you know why uh, you have four colleges, right? You have Cinnamon, Tembusu, Name of the Trees, then you have CAPT, that's not Name After a Tree, and then RC4, that's Name After a Number. <laughs> do, do, do. do you know why? Actually, it was four colleges, right? Cinnamon, Tembusu, Angsana, and Kaya. RC4 was originally called Kaya. Kaya is a, is, a, is a type of a tree that's linked to the mahogany uh, genus. Um, but when, before, Kaya, before RC4 opened, uh, Angsana was actually named Angsana. We felt that Kaya was not a good name because, you know, either you're mistaken it for the coconut jam, Kaya, <laughs> or Kaya in Malay means rich. And you don't want people to say, oh, this is the rich college, you know, Kaya College. So we decided, I just call it RC4 for the moment. For the moment. <laughs> and that moment never passed. Yeah. <laughs> or not yet, anyway, not yet, yeah. Angsana was called Angsana, but within six months of it being open, um, a donor came forward, uh, Alice and Peter Tan, and they, dis they gave some gift to the college, and the college was, of course, then renamed um, College of Alice and Peter Tan. Now, this is a very interesting phenomenon. Just six months, the, the, the residents of Angsana got so attached to the name that they were quite upset when they were told that they had to rename their college. Um, but in the end, um, they were persuaded to do so, and I think CAPT has now um, taken on a kind of distinct identity of itself. And I remember when I attended uh, first Angsana dinner, um, they had a pledge, and the pledge was called the Angsanian, don't know what, don't know what. And then, Six months later, they had to change from Angsana to Kept, but they were quite clever. They call it the Captains or something like that. Okay, so the last factoid. Do you know that U-Town is a trademark name? It's a trademark name. That means you all can't use it any old how. Eh? And the reason why I decided to trademark U-Town was because I didn't want the other universities to copy it. And I know some universities are very prone to copying things that come from NUS. So I just wanted to be sure that you didn't have another U-Town in another part of Singapore. They can call it what they want. University Village, University Kampong, I don't care. <laughs> but they don't call it U-Town. So on that note, I'm going to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. This is for young, don't balance.